My name is Herb Solo. In 1964, I was hired by Lucille Ball to revive television production at the Failing Desilu Studios. And as such, I was responsible for the development, sales, and production of Desilu's television series. Mission Impossible, Mannix, and Star Trek. Star Trek, the most discussed and far and above the most written about series in the history of television. But over the years, much of the history of the original or classic Star Trek, the when, why, where, and how of the legendary series has become lost. And much of what remains has become clouded. Rumor has become fact, myth has become reality, and truth has become fiction. This video, Inside Star Trek The Real Story, goes a long way towards setting the record straight, to credit those who contributed importantly, and properly introduce them to the Star Trek world, to tell their story, to tell the real story. You won't see any of the Star Trek actors. You've all heard and enjoyed their stories for over 30 years. But you will see and hear for the first time from the people who employed them, paid them, wrote their characters, created their worlds, the people who put words in their mouths, phases in their hands, hair on their heads, clothes on their backs, and music in the galaxy. These are the people who truly created Star Trek. Most of the people you will see have never spoken publicly about Star Trek, but they are doing so now. And they're not talking about what did not happen, only what did actually happen. After all, it's their story too. Solo at that time was the best thing that ever happened to Desilu. And he set up the, the, the meeting because Herb knew me, knew Grant, he knew everybody at NBC because he at one point worked at NBC in a relatively important position. So when, he came, when Herb came to sell the show to us, we sat and we listened, and the rest is history. At the end of that meeting, uh, I, I think we we tried to say go away and let us think about this and um, Roddenberry was ready to get up and give up and Solo said sit down let's let's do this and I, I think uh, it was a matter of our not affection for Herb Solo but our respect for him that l led us to to sit down and talk about it some more and, and finally out of it came uh, came the script. We would get involved with, and basically in development of any of the shows that were going to be on NBC, particularly at the pilot stage. Um, not that we would dictate terms, we would be in the, in the uh, position of consultation. We would have cast approval, we would have script approval, and uh, beyond that uh, it was up to the production or the producers, the production company, to, uh, to deliver the product to us within the standards of, of our network. There were two, not scurrilous lies, but but misguided beliefs ab about uh, the, the casting within the show th that uh, also caused NBC some grief. Uh, neither of them was true. One was that NBC, for whatever reason, leaned away from a, a woman being in a strong lead role in a series, and that 
I can tell you because I was involved wasn't true at all. And I can tell you in terms of a, a, an important black character, it would not be true either. Uh, and my, uh, my best uh, refutation would be, uh, would be Bill Cosby, who at almost the same time uh, came in with Sheldon Leonard and, uh, and Bob Culp, and, and we ordered a series and packed them off to Europe to do I Spy. The question of, of uh, NBC's attitude about a strong woman is, strikes me as being ludicrous because there, is, there was nothing, nothing in any of our thoughts or policies that would, would exclude uh, women, strong or otherwise, being in a cast of a, of a show. Uh, we have had shows like Ironside, Barbara Anderson was a, was a very important character there and when she left she was replaced by another woman whose name at the moment escapes me. Um, we had a Barbara Stanwyck series where she was the lead in the series, it was her show in effect. Um, we can go clear back to the Loretta Young show. The second pilot I think, I, I think probably appealed to us more because some of the things that had been complaints from elsewhere about the first had been eliminated by uh, Herb and, uh, and, uh, and Gene and Justin and whoever else worked on the thing. Um, they, they, you know, toned, they toned down some of those and yet there were others. Spock would be one who you know, had not received raves in the first case but appeared, as I remember, pretty much the same way, if not exactly the same way, in the second. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. It might have been also that uh, the sales department and others back in New York at NBC were a little more conditioned, less, less surprised, if you will, because they'd, they'd already seen one version, and now here was one a little less uh, troubling to them, and, and, and all of those things together probably made it uh, easier to, uh, to buy and schedule. We were... Uh, taken to task by those fans it did have for canceling it eventually. Uh, there was then the sort of, I think, Roddenberry inspired uh, mail writing campaign and uh, I don't know how many letters Gene actually thought we got or whether he just pulled a multi-million letter figure out of the woodwork, but he, you know, he claimed that it had been, you know, the whole country was writing and it I think it turned out to be a few thousand letters, um, something over 10,000, I think. Mort and I were constantly waiting for it to, to catch on and maybe kept it on a little longer than it might have stayed if the sales department had had its way. Uh, but, it, but in any case, it, 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 it fell just short of three years and, and never did make it on NBC. The president of the network uh, was very supportive. Uh, the top executives of the network were very supportive of the show. NBC didn't set out to destroy its own show. NBC was very supportive of Star Trek. And in fact, when the first pilot didn't satisfy, for whatever reasons, and they were valid reasons for them, uh, they commissioned a second pilot. That was unheard of then, and it's unheard of today. They supported the show. Uh, there was a network there that really did care. After all, we could have been canceled at the end of the first season. But they decided, uh, it was their decision to make, and they decided to, to try again, as they did for the third season. I have felt for years that NBC didn't get any credit uh, it, it, and it's pretty true that they didn't for keeping it on as, as long as, as we had it on. Uh, Roddenberry, I think, included or was included in the group of people who had no feeling of gratitude at all that it had been exposed as much as it had on NBC. The opening narration, those inspirational words that have set the tone for everything that is Star Trek. 
Did you ever wonder where the opening narration came from? Well, this is how it started, with Gene Roddenberry's first draft. This was followed by Gene's second draft. A first-year associate producer and story editor, John D.F. Black followed Gene with his version. Bob Justman took what had been written and revised it this way. And Gene Roddenberry wrote his third version. And several meetings later, it all came together. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. The phrase, where no man has gone before, came from writer Sam Peoples. When Sam turned in his script of the second Star Trek pilot, that was the title, where no man has gone before. First year associate producer, writer, and story editor to John D.F. Black recognized the strength of the title and incorporated it into his version of the opening narration. John Black, in addition to adding drama to the narration, contributed even more. The phrases space, the final frontier, and to seek out and to explore. As a matter of fact, the major portion of Captain Kirk's opening narration came from the mind of John D.F. Black. That's how it happened. That's the real story. But before there was an opening narration, before there was a pilot or a series, before there was a Star Trek, there was a beginning. It all started here at Desilu Studios. On the top floor of this building was our projection room where we screened our shows and our pilots for the networks. NBC first saw both of our Star Trek pilots up there. Early in 1964, a young writer, Gene Roddenberry, walked into that door and up one flight of stairs just inside the doorway and up to my office where, after listening to his sort of uninspired presentation, we decided to give Gene a deal to develop his idea for a new television series, Star Trek. Gene didn't even have an office on the lot at that point. And he came in and in about uh, seven or eight minutes uh, told me what the show was to be about and uh, said he didn't want to see any rocket trails or jets, but make it look like it got power, and he walked out. And I sat there with my brother, what, what he's talking about? Matt Jeffries was perhaps the most responsible person for the success, in my opinion at least, for the success of Star Trek. He was the production designer, although at that time he was called the art director. He literally put the set together with spit and wire. We had no budget whatsoever by any, e even those days, standards. Uh, he was brilliant at, at improvising answers to uh, uh, requests that nobody had any business asking someone with no budget to accomplish. I went and spent some of Lucy's money on whatever I could find in downtown Hollywood on Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. And as a member of the uh, Aviation Space Writers Association, I had all kinds of material from NASA and the companies that were working on the space program. Pinned it all up on the wall and said, this is what I will not do. And then began to try to come up with shapes. And a week or so later, Gene came back and he liked a piece of this one and a piece of that one. And whatever he passed without comment got ash canned immediately. And then we began to try to fit the pieces together that he had given a little bit of a nod of affirmation on. And went through another week or 10 days of that and we went through the same procedure again. And I was getting more frustrated by the day. And finally came up with something that I thought would work and uh, I preloaded the deal. 
That one got, got a good artistic treatment and we did sell it. So with refinement, it became the Enterprise. In the main title of Star Trek, they were wondering whether the Starship Enterprise should make any noise at all. Obviously in space, uh, with no atmosphere, there is no noise because there's nothing for the sound to travel through. So in theory, when we see the Starship Enterprise going through space, we should, uh, there should be no sound. We here on Earth associate things traveling like jet planes and <laughs> with noise. A compromise was made and there is a noise laid on the soundtrack. So we'll sell the idea that the Star Trek Enterprise is going somewhere. When we finished the first recording of the score for the first, the original pilot, uh, they were discussing in the booth uh, what was one of their problems was that they hadn't been able to find a good sound for the rocket ship going across the screen at the main title when you see it come in and you know, shoot across the screen. So I said, I, you know, you have nothing to lose. Let me go out there and give me a microphone that's open. And, uh, and see what happens and run the picture. So um, they ran the picture and I got close to the microphone and I just went <laughs> Herb Solo was one of the people most responsible. Herb and, and, and Gene Roddenberry, I guess, were the two people most responsible for my doing the pilot of Star Trek. I remember on the last day of shooting of the pilot of Star Trek, uh, one of our major obligations was to do it in a certain amount of hours uh, and we were running late and uh, Lucille Ball, who was the, uh, the head of the studio really, Lucy and, and, and uh, Desi, uh, that's why it was Desi Lou, uh, she had invited everybody she knew, the executives at NBC, all sorts of friends to the rap party. We were scheduled to wrap at, say, 7 o'clock at night, and I was still shooting. Uh, we were still shooting, and, and, and I was getting pretty far down on my shot list and being pushed pretty hard by everybody. And uh, Lucy kept coming in from the next soundstage where they were all set up with champagne, caviar, and things of that kind. For the and She was dressed to the nines. And uh, her sh hair shining redly, she came into the set and said, Jim, when are you going to be finished? When are you going to be finished? When are you going to be finished? Her concern was, of course, that she had all these guests in the next stage, and uh, they couldn't pop the corks out of the champagne bottles until we finished shooting. Uh, so Lucy said, is there anything I can do? And I said, yeah, Lucy, I'll tell you what you do. You walk just ahead of the dolly. We were shooting at three-quarter angle. You walk just ahead of the dolly with a broom and sweep the styrofoam up and maybe I can get this shot and we can have the wrap party. And Lucy in her semi-formal cocktail gown with a big stage broom swept in front of the dolly. We got the shot. We all went in and had champagne. When you're trying to make rapport with a story editor who's going to respect your work, who's going to lend his own heart and soul to it, often give you the very best ideas that are in the script, came from his fertile sponge of a mind, from all the stories he's heard and read, and he gives them to you freely, stealing them from wherever he can find them, and you change them and alter them and cram them into your story, and eventually it has a form. But it's part of a process, because the minute it's turned into a form, then you've got to turn it into another form called a script, and because you've only been writing the story up till now. And now you turn the script in, and it's only a first draft of the script. And they stab 16 wounds into the script that tear the symmetry and the purpose of it apart. And they say, but we believe in you, kid. Go home. Do it. You've still got... And off you go to do it. And you do it again. And you do it several times before you finally get an acceptance, which then means they are going to pay you. And that's the lure that holds you together and holds them together. God bless them. We couldn't have done Star Trek without Gene Kuhn. Uh, with Gene Kuhn, we entered another whole era. He came along, it was about, I'd say, August, somewhere in August of 1966. 
And I didn't know him. I knew that he'd been working on Wild Wild West and evidently could churn out a goodly amount of material in a short amount of time. And in fact, I didn't make up my mind about Gene Kuhn until I read some of his work, some of his rewrites, and walked into his office one day and stood there astounded while he typed at approximately 80 million words a minute uh, and churned out a script in like three or four days. I'd never seen anything like that before. Gene Kuhn was an absolute gem. As you know, he could type his story as he wrote it and you could pull the paper out of the typewriter and send it right to Xerox. Uh, he did have a line, if I came in, he said, I cannot design a show or do a show that's only got one set in it. Leave me alone. I never bothered him that much. I, I adored working with Gene Kuhn. That was Gene Roddenberry's office back there, and Gene Kuhn was there, associate producer Bob Justman was there. The office staff was housed with them. Since everyone worked unusually long hours every day, I think it's important to call your attention to the office staff who were always there, working along with their bosses, and like everyone else, putting their lives on hold during the typical 14-hour Star Trek workday. Here was the Desilu Art Department and the Office of Production Designer, Art Director, Matt Jeffries. I had this built up so we could show a director what the set would look like when he got in it to work. Because a great many of these pieces would be folded and back leaning up against the wall because we were short of stage space. So it was merely a tool to help uh, let him understand what he was going to be faced with. This is a model, scale model, the red represents the stage walls, stage nine at the original Desi Lou lot, and at a quarter inch to the foot, these are all of the sets that we had for the interior of the Starship Enterprise. This is the bridge with two of the typical units pulled out, engineering, our corridor, and the infamous Jeffrey's tube there. This is Kirk's quarters and his office. The briefing room is over here, Sick bay down in the end, it's green. And Dr. McCoy's exam room, his office, Dr. McCoy's lab, and the famous transporter room is over here. And all in the colors as were the original sets. You know, I, I found the Tribbles. Uh, I went to a drugstore. I had seen a fuzzy little something on the counter. I think it was a keychain or something like that. I wasn't sure what it was. But around, so I went to this drugstore, and sure enough, there was this purple, uh, tinted little feathery thing sitting on the, on the counter. And I said, "What is that?" He said, "Well, it's a keychain." I said, I, "I want one of those. Could I?" He said, so I bought it. So I gave this little device to Irving Feinberg, and I said, "Can you get your uh, special effects guy to uh, first of all get a lot of these, or if, get a lot of them, and we'll have them painted all different colors, and uh, I mean get oodles of them." thousands if you can but I want two or three that actually move the original script for the pilot of Star Trek was titled Menagerie and we in the research department at DeForest Research didn't see it until it was in script form and came to us to review just like any other Desi Lu script or any other script from any other client. So we got this script and the script originally had dates in it like 2362 and months and days. I felt that that sounded a little awkward for the 23rd, 22nd century. So I thought that there should be another another dating system. So I checked that, yes, the astronomers had a way of dating called the Julian Day system, in which, based on the calculations of a 16th century French mathematician philosopher, that felt that because he devised this calendar with a thousands and thousands of year cycle, and each day was numbered. And astronomers have used that since because it 
you don't have to bother with years and leap years in AD and BC. So I suggested to Gene Roddenberry that there was this system out there. The days would be numbered. And he picked up on that and coined the term star date and dated the log and the dating in Star Trek with this star date system. I wanted to have a sound that was unearthly, not, not of this world. So I combined, a, a, I think it was a, an electric flute and a very early primitive synthesizer and a vibraphone and a girl's voice singing, ah, dear little Luli Jean Norman, who is the best of the, of the studio singers, did that. And this is the street where it all happened, where every episode of the Star Trek series was filmed. On that stage, we shot our first and only true comedy episode, directed by James Comack. I was known as the comedy director. Ha uh-huh. ha. And, um... And I'd come out of comedy. I'd been a nightclub comic. I'd done funny shows. I did Hennessy. I did a Dick Van Dyke show. And they asked me one day to do Star Trek. Ooh, Star Trek's a spooky show. It's an hour for one instead of a half hour. And it's very, ooh, people going up and down and beam me up. Beam, I don't know what they're talking They want me to do a Star Trek? All right, I'll try. We have a very funny script. I get the script. It is not particularly funny. What's funny about it is that the Star Trek people are doing this. It's called a piece of the action. When I came to work at Star Trek, Bill Shatner knew me, knew of me. So he knew I was funny. Or I was a comedy person. Um, he, preening, you know, wanted to say, hey, I'm funny too. So he's, he's on my side to start with. If he can make me laugh or justify his behavior to me in comedic senses, that's great for him. He liked that. And Leonard Nimoy, of course, you know, he's going to be... He's another Jerry Lewis, <laughs> which he's not with the point that, but that's what he wants. And they really deferred to me because to, to get my acceptance was, now that's a lot different than a normal director or a normal activity of going to work as a director in a, 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 a running show and you're an itinerant director showing up. They want to test you and see, do you really know what you're doing? You know, we stand here and this is the way we do it and we only do this and you shoot from this angle and you don't shoot my bad side, you shoot my good side. Don't go up my nostrils, not in my case. In my case, go up my nostrils if it's funny. And if I say, I'm going to shoot up your nostrils, oh yeah, that's hysterical. So they really, they really got into it. And I had a great time because it was my acceptance they were looking for. And I did, um, for what I did in the days that I did it, I guess I got, you know, it was a funny show. And I have a scene with Uhura. And this is this black actress, Nichelle Nichols. And there she is looking quite beautiful on the bridge. And there is the Vulcan, Mr. Spock. And I've got a cover a half a page, a page and a half of dialogue between the two of them that's supposed to humanize them, supposed to put them together. So I have her ask him, because uh, she's just had a romantic interlude with the salt vampire, thinking it a black African like herself, a Swahili. And so now she's looking off dreamily and she says, what is it like on a moonlit evening on Vulcan? And he looks at her coldly and he says, Vulcan has no moons. And she looks at him wryly and she says, I'm not surprised, Mr. Spock and it breaks your heart to see her and it's all just done with a few words and just a little intercutting it was written into the script it paid off it works maybe one of the ways to have a different sound for the sound effects on the alien planet would be to make the sound the basis of the sound effect musically the the wind going through the whatever those things were on the on the planet the elevator doors opening and shutting and things like that were all based on musical beginnings. We had about five people over at the Glen Glen studio one night and we just fooled around with, with the things and they were equalizing and throwing all kinds of, of stuff into it. And, uh, but um, we did it you know, musically first. Every episode of Star Trek was the result of the efforts of hundreds of enormously talented people. 
the actors, in fact, were among the last to add their contributions. So well before Bill and Leonard and Dee, Jimmy, George, Nichelle, Walter and the others arrived on the set, everything had been prepared for another episode of Star Trek. The three people that, that I recall, uh, Roddenberry, Solo and uh, Justman, the one I was most intimate with was Justman. Uh, he made such enormous contributions to Star Trek that will never really be fully realized uh, by the layperson, maybe even the people who made Star Trek. But for me, he was tremendously important in the development and the final uh, realization of the value of Star Trek. I think he was intimately concerned with it. Now what happened on that is Delinsky wrote it for the Vulcan to kiss uh, Michelle. And I said, no, Mike, I don't want that. I want it to be Shatner. Because if that comes out, that's the Vulcan, they say, we didn't have guts enough to have a white man kiss this black girl. And we'd make a point anyway that way. And Delinsky fought against it, you know, as a writer, he wondered what it was. I said, no way, we're going to do this. And that's what it's going to be. Now, when program practice called up about a white man kissing a girl. I talked to him, I felt I won that battle. So that's the way the script was written and went down. And we had quite a fight. One of the reasons that Star Trek, the pilot, where no man has gone before, was so successful was the design of the costumes by Bill Theiss. Uh, it was the, and it's sort of amusing in retrospect, there was this new material um, that was soft and fuzzy. What is it called? Vel uh, not Velcro. Velcro is what we stuck the guns on. Uh, um, velour. And velour does not wrinkle and doesn't get shadows. We didn't have time to change for wardrobe changes, and we didn't want shadows. There are no shadows in outer space. And so uh, Bill... Bill, I think, came up with the idea of making the costumes out of velour. The later you go in the season, the more shows you have under your belt, the less time there is for post-production, uh, and the more dangerous it gets with respect to meeting your air date schedule. And I reached the point during the summer of 1966 when I went home one night and composed a letter to an NBC executive in which I told him that they were expecting the impossible from us and that there was no way we were going to meet our air dates. And I made the mistake, or maybe I had the good fortune, to mention that I wanted to send this letter to the executive, and I told Herb Solo. And Herb told me, under no circumstances will you send that letter. Uh, what they don't know won't hurt them, and don't worry about it, we'll make it. And sure enough, we did. Devil in the Dark episode was one of the most interesting in that it had a major scientific problem. The problem was that this giant worm that ate rock was the featured menace of this episode. The idea was that he lived in a different kind of environment that would support life that was not carbon-based. Therefore, the question was, what other chemical could support life other than carbon? And I do not recall what the original draft of the script had, but it wasn't right. So we checked, I, this wasn't a call to NASA, but we, I think we called Caltech. We checked through books and uh, determined that silicon in theory could support a life system. So, and this fit very well into this rock dwelling creature. So the planet, the creature and the planet became a silicon-based creature and planet. Making films should be fun, and there was a lot of fun during that chaotic eight days or so of shooting the pilot. Uh, Sally Kellerman, with whom I had 
never worked before. I'd known her, but not worked with her, and Gary Lockwood, with whom I had worked on the lieutenant, uh, had to wear silver contact lenses. And those are the early days of contact lenses, not the soft ones that some people wear now. And uh, they had to go to ophthalmologist or an optometrist and have these these opaque uh, or non-opaque, I guess, um, uh, contact lenses made. Uh, and we would rehearse a scene, physically block a scene. And they would have the contact lenses out, and then they would put them in. And Gary, as I recall, Sally was tough, and Gary wasn't tough, and it hurt Gary's eyes, not Sally's. Uh, they would have to remember exactly how many steps it was in the blocking to get to a certain place where they would stop because they couldn't see a thing uh, uh, with these things in their eyes. And then the, uh, the nest of bees at the top of the sound stage where we were shooting uh, broke loose one day. I guess it got too hot up there. And so not only was the cast and crew running around swatting at flies, hopefully not in front of the camera too often, but we had two blind actors who were attempting to avoid the, uh, the things that were buzzing around their ears. And that was one of the, the, uh, the ongoing theses I had with Gene Roddenberry. We have to make these people human. The cast of characters must constantly be human, recognizable as people of today, not as of tomorrow. The things that you will give them to say and the things that you will give them to do will make them special. In 1968, Desi Lewis sold to Paramount, which was his next door neighbor, and that corrugated metal fence that had separated Paramount and Desi Lugaro all those years was torn down, and Desi Lu was no more. So unless you've read about it somewhere, or a friend told you, there's no way for you to know that this part of the Paramount lot, the western part, was once Desi Lu Studios. There aren't any signs, there's nothing painted over, all that's left are just great memories. Working at Desilu was great fun because, first, it was run by actors, comedians, Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz. Uh, they had a certain kind of simpatico with people like from me who comes out of nightclubs and tells jokes for a living and then work comedy shows. I worked at the Dick Van Dyke show for them. Uh, it's... There was just a fun atmosphere. Um, it was like, you know, when young people are getting together and they hang up in the hills in their houses and talk about how great they're going to be and how wonderful life is going to be when someone recognizes them. When you're at Desilu, that's the way you were. You were there, you were being recognized, and you still felt like you were um, not employed in, in, uh, in any uh, um, <clears throat> stricture kind of sense. You were there as one of their friends, as one of their people, and you really much, generally had run of the lot, you could do what you want. Here, let me tell you something about Star Trek. I never had such a good time in my life. I was welcome at the studio. There would always be somebody there probably working. I could go over to the cafeteria. I could wander through the sound stages while I'm working furiously on a screenplay. Really, really working very, very hard. But hanging out and not feeling lonely and alone in a room. And I was welcome. What do we do? We are free to come and go. And nobody questions us. And the guards let us on freely in this parking space. And the cafeteria has certain regular eating hours. And there's always three or four guys coming in. And, and you're always welcome. And it turns into a bull session, a story conference, with each guy doing his act. The funniest experience in Star Trek, and some people don't think it's funny, but I just, just fell down when it happened to me. Production, you know. <laughs> Production was always concerned about money, right? They're always going to talk about money. I get a call from production. It said, Fred, Shatner is sending in a bill, $15 for breakfast every morning. Now, that was quite some time ago, so $15 is a lot. So I said, what do you want me to do about it? 
And he said, well, he's the only one you listen he's, You're the only one he listens to. Can you go down and talk to him about it? I said, well, I don't want to go down and talk to a guy about breakfast, $15. They said, Fred, you got to do it, you know. So I go down and see Shaq. I go into the dressing room. I said, Bill, how did you get it arrive at $15? He said, well, it's not just for me. I said, well, who else? He said, me and my dog. I said, you and your dog? I said, what does your dog eat? He's the same as me, bacon and eggs, potatoes, french fries and corn. Well, I just, I just, I said to him, Bill, if you promise that we'll never, you'll never repeat this conversation to anybody, forget it. <laughs> I just walked out. Sadly, some of the people whose efforts made Star Trek are gone now. Gene Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, Mark Daniels, who directed more episodes than anyone else, Bill Tice, Mort Werner, Lucille Ball, one of the best of the science fiction writers, Theodore Sturgeon, makeup supervisor, Freddie Phillips, cameraman, Ernie Haller, script consultant, author Singer. We, we shot at uh, uh, the studio where Gone with the Wind was made, incidentally, with the director of photography of Gone with the Wind, whom we hired for this because uh, it was my theory that uh, that we should have somebody who had encountered almost every kind of difficulty that one could encounter in filmmaking, and he uh, was no kid, and he had encountered them, if on nothing else, Gone with the Wind uh, some 50 years before. Um, what was his name? His name was Ernest Haller, and he was a marvelous old man. We were in England in uh, 91, 49 years to, to the day really from when I set foot on it the first time. And we were at an air museum up in the uh, Midlands. We had 40 artists in the group. And we were in the museum all morning and came out afterwards and they were having a classic car event. There must have been 200 antique and classic cars there on a nice summer afternoon. And uh, got in the bus and the driver couldn't start it. He had run the batteries down using the telephone. So we spent all afternoon of that summer afternoon sitting around in the grass, and somebody said something about Star Trek, and for the next two or three hours, all I did was sketch the Enterprise and give autograph. And I guess if I had been smart like a baseball player, I could have picked up a few few bucks on it. I like the show. I, I, it's, uh, as I'm sure any number of people among us at NBC said to Herb from the day he first came in with it, uh, it, it was not the kind of show, sci-fi I guess to use a, a you know, a overly broad term, that a lot of us catered to. Uh, so, so in my case, what I liked about it was, it was a show in an area I normally wouldn't have appreciated, but done so well that I did, I did like it. And, and one of the reasons I, I have referred to before, and it had to do with this cozy, family, womb-like thing that I, that I have called it, uh, where they were all together, couldn't be untogether, uh, went wherever they went together, uh, and, and, and had to you know, learn how to deal with each other at lo as a family does. I thought that was, that was a, a strength of the show. It's a strange thing because I, you know, a, 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 one of my closest and earliest friends in the business, m wonderful man named Herbert Winfield Spencer, who was one of the great arrangers at Fox in the great days of the Fox musicals in the 30s and 40s, just looked at me one day and he said, you know, he said, you've had quite a checkered career. <laughs> so, and he, it's true. I mean, I've done so many different things in so many different ways, and I've done so many musicals. I've done a few large pictures scoring. I've done a, a few bad small pictures scoring. I've done a huge amount of television. The one thing that I'm known for apparently around the world is the fact that I happen to write the original theme for the original Star Trek series. If I were to be buried, which I don't intend to be, uh, and there were a headstone, which I hope there never is, it would probably say here lies, what's his name, who directed the pilot of Star Trek. The great thing about it, or the marvelous thing about it, 
is everywhere I go, with all of the credits that I carry with me, everything, I'd be too long if I told you all my credits. They all say, Star Trek? You did Star Trek? And if I said, yeah, I'm Jimmy Comac, I did, oh, you did Piece of the Action. They know the name of the show. They know the show. And they tell me how hysterical it was, how funny it was. I've seen it. It's okay. But they think it's great. And that's Star Trek. It's got its own magic. The countdown to oblivion began with the shooting of the last episode, Turnabout Intruder. Seven dull and uneventful days later, on January 9th, 1969, it was all over. The 79th episode had run one day over schedule and $6,000 over budget. Captain Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise had finally landed, and Star Trek was dismantled. The last episode broadcast on NBC was the last episode shot, Turnabout Intruder. It aired on Tuesday, June 3rd, 1969, at 7.30 p.m. And its Nielsen rating was indicative of NBC's displeasure and its audience's defection over the three-year network lifespan. The episode aired on a different night and different time, received a rating of only 8.8. .8. From the premiere of Mantrak to the finale of Turnabout Intruder, despite all the letter-writing campaigns, the marches on and the harassment of the network, after all the petitions and phone calls and everything else, Star Trek's Nielsen ratings had, from birth to death, dropped by well over 50%. And after 79 episodes of joy and sorrow, birthday parties, weddings, and funerals, lifelong friendships and short-lived hostilities, broken dreams, and pride of performance, Star Trek was canceled at the end of its third year. The first prime time adult science fiction color television series would always be looked on as a gallant and expensive effort that failed. Star Trek was consigned to perpetual oblivion in the most distant quadrant of the most distant galaxy, to a place where all unsuccessful series go to die. It would never be heard from again. Or so we thought.